You know, we have a Savior who gave his life to us that we might give our lives to him. And who knows where this world's headed, and we're going to be talking a lot about that this morning. And it has a lot to do with marriage and the family. You'll see the connection as we go along here. But this morning I want to talk again about the power of marriage and the family. So I'd like you to turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. And again, we're just going to introduce this section. We've looked at the Spirit-filled life. It's been an amazing uh, study because really that, that's really what the Christian life is all about once you become a Christian. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no life. And we've talked about uh, uh, verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 5 to uh, walk as wise men uh, and women, not as unwise. We've talked about making the most of our time because the days are evil, and we're going to see that today. Uh, we've talked about not being foolish, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And we've talked about what it means to be spirit-filled, that a spirit-filled person is a one who worships God and he helps others worship God and, and uh, he's one who's always thankful for all things and, and one who's subject to one another in the fear of Christ. And we saw that spirit-filled relationships really form any relationship that's worth having in this world. And now we're going to get to the particulars. Paul says wives. And here he's addressing those who are wives or those who are intending to be wives, and I hope all you young ladies are intending to be wives. He says, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. And then he addresses husbands. Husbands, love your wives. How? Just as... Christ also loved the church, and he gave himself up for her, speaking of sacrificial love. He says, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but... He nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. And then he ends this section on husbands and wives. It says, nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife as himself, and the wife must see that she respects her husband. Now, for the next so many weeks, we're going to be doing a study on marriage and the family. We began that last week. Uh, many of you have expressed to me that it was kind of a it was a good message, but a kind of alarming message. Uh, what's going on in our country and around the world? And and as we do this, we are going to uh, address husbands and wives in Ephesians chapter five. We're going to address fathers, mothers, and children at the beginning of Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to look at God's design for the most basic of all social institutions, marriage, and the most basic of all building blocks for any society that prospers, and that's the family. They're both individually and corporately addressed here. Because marriage and the family is the key issue in any social order. Exalt it, promote it, stimulate it, and watch a society prosper because it's a God's ideal for culture. Look at the early years of America. And I'm talking about the first maybe 200, 250 years. Not too many democracies last beyond about 300 years. But uh, look at those first few years where uh, one man was committed to one woman and the children derived from that union. Uh, and he would do anything to make that union a great one, and to make the union literally of the United States of America into a great country. And they did. We became the greatest nation that has ever probably been in existence, one nation under God, and uh, governed primarily by the principles of God's Word in what was once a union that made America great, and I'm speaking of the family. 
It's what made America great. But since the 60s, we've abandoned that. And it's every man out for himself and his own pleasure and his own whatever he wants. And, and uh, we've become very similar to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-7 through that, that says uh, that men will become lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, unstable, unholy, unloving, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, uh, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. It says, holding to a form of religion, although they have denied its power. And that pretty much defines our culture today. Both in America and in many places, particularly Western Europe. Uh, a lot of in Eastern Europe too. And uh, it pretty much defines our culture, the cultures around our world today. Marriage and family has fallen on hard times, although... It is the most important social structure that there is, bar nothing else. But that doesn't lessen uh, the fact that it's fallen on hard times. That doesn't lessen the power of marriage and the family on culture. It's still God's ideal, and it's still the ideal for any culture. Now, just like anything else in this world, this power can be used for good or for evil, depending on the intent of the people or the society involved, can it? Marriage and family is still God's ideal. It doesn't matter how evil the society is or how evil the country has become or what their aim is, whether it's world conquest, world domination, or whether it's just a you know, party, that kind of thing. Marriage can use, be used for good or evil, and that's where we're at today. Those who practice God's principles and want to put God's principles into practice, prosper. Those who don't, don't. And that's either on a big scale or a small scale. Now, just to illustrate this, how powerful the power of marriage in the family is, let me relate to you the following statistics. And these are not for the faint-hearted, okay? Uh, if you're faint-hearted, uh, it would probably be better if you go out in the foyer. <laughs> Seriously. Um, it's kind of scary. In order for a culture to maintain itself for a period of 25 years, it must have a fertility rate, that's children, uh, of 2.11 children per family. Otherwise, it will uh, go into a state of decline. Let me illustrate this. Say you have two couples. Those couples have one child. That one child gets together with the other child. They produce one child. In two generations, you have 75% less people. Understand the statistics here? Two produce one, two, or four produce two, Two produces one. Ultimately, you have 25% less people, or 75% less people. Historically, no culture has ever reversed or come back from a 1.9 fertility rate. 1.9. Statistically, a 1.3 fertility rate is impossible to reverse because it takes at least 80 to 100 years to reverse it, and by that time, the culture is either been conquered from without or rotten from within. That's the reality of the situation. It's happened over and over and over again in history. Now, as of 2007, and I believe the statistics are even more lopsided by now, the fertility rate of France was 1.8. England, it was 1.6. Greece, Greece 1.3. Germany, 1.3. Italy, 1.2. Spain was 1.1. And across the entirety of the European Union, composed of 31 countries, and keep in mind the European Union is our ally, their fertility rate is 1.38. Totally irreversible. There's no way Europe can come back to be the power it once was within the next hundred years or so. 
It is soon to be conquered, I believe. And I'll tell you why. The population of Europe is not declining. Isn't that a scary thing? Their fertility rate is around 1.3, 1.4, but the population is not declining. Why isn't it declining? Well, because of immigration. And since 1990, 90% of that immigration has been Muslim. 90%. It's incredible. For example, in France, with a 1.8 fertility rate, the Islamic fertility rate is 8.1. 8.1. It's like eight times, or four or five times, at least what the French fertility rate is. In southern France, there are now more mosques than churches. 30% of children born in France under 20 are Islamic, and they're growing up daily. In the larger cities like Nice or Marseille or Paris, the numbers are more like 45% of those under 20 are Islamic. By 2027, one in five French will be Muslim, and they're saying that in just under 40 years, France will be an Islamic republic. Take England, for example. We pray for our missionaries in England. They're in Birmingham, England. And uh, <laughs> it was funny, John uh, sent an uh, email telling what was going on, and somebody had said that Birmingham is 100% Muslim. No, it's not. It's 25%. But keep in mind, population is exponential after a certain point. When you have two producing eight and eight producing eight more, you have a huge exponential explosion. England. In the last 30 years, the Muslim population of England has grown by 82,000 to two point, from 82,000 to 2.5 million, which is a 30-fold increase. There are now over 1,000 mosques on English soil, many where churches used to be, or many of those churches have already been converted to mosques. England and Europe in general is in need of a massive revival in turning to Christ. I think it's one less than 1% claims to really be a Christian, a real Christian. In the Netherlands, 50% of all newborns are Muslim. In less than 15 years, half the population of the Netherlands will be Muslim due to immigration and population. In Russia, there are now over 23 million Muslims. One out of every five Russians, or 20%, are Islamic. With just in a few years, 40% of the entire Russian military will be Islamic. And if that doesn't frighten you, nothing will because they're chummy with Iran and with the Muslim nations that surround Israel. In Belgium, 25% of the population and 50% of all newborns are Muslim. The Belgian government has stated that one-third of all children in Europe will be born to Muslim families by 2025. That's just 10 years away. And as I said, population is exponential after a certain point. Even Germany has stated that the decline of their population is now irreversible. Many are predicting that they will be a Muslim state by 2050. You know, no less a fallen star than Muammar Gaddafi, once dictator of Libya, now dead, uh, said that the 50-plus million Muslims in Europe will turn it into a Muslim continent in a matter of a few decades. In 2007, there were 52 million Muslims in Europe. Within 20 years, they expect there to be twice that many. It's over 100 million. Now, let's take this a little closer to home. Canada has a declining birth rate of 1.6, and yet from 2001 to 2006, the population has increased 1.6 million. 1.2 million of that has been immigration, uh, mostly, again, Muslim. Or take the U.S. We have a fertility rate of 1.6, but with the end, that's why I said last, last uh, 
Sunday, get married and have a lot of babies. You know, keep them coming. But with the influx of the Latino nations, it hovers around 2.11, barely enough to sustain a nation. By way of contrast, in 1970, there were 100,000 Muslims in the U.S. By 2007, there were over 9 million. That's a 90-fold increase. 90-fold. In 2004, 24 Islamic organizations met in Chicago for an Islamic strategy conference to unveil their plan to evangelize America through journalism, politics, and education uh, because they said they must prepare for the fact there will be 50 million Muslims in America in 30 years. Pretty alarming if you know anything about the Islamic religion. In 2007, Islam surpassed the numbers of the Roman Catholic Church and in a few more years will be the dominant world religion surpassing what, quote, calls itself Christianity. Now, I hope each of us understands what's being said here. It's very alarming, yet at the same time, it's a call back to what God has established for society, the power of marriage and the family. The fact that marriage and the family can be at the center of what glorifies God, as we just read in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33, and, and in uh, chapter 6, or its power can be used to spread, as Franklin Graham called Islam after the 9-11 attacks, one of the most evil, wicked religions on the face of the earth to promote their goals of world conquest and domination. And yet, we as Americans mostly have our head in the sands. We believe, although probably 98% of the terrorism and whatever that goes on in this world is generated by Islam, we believe it's a religion of peace. Um, you know, our goal, even as Christians, seems to just be to get along. You know, we need to take over the world, not in a political, military sense, but we need to get the gospel out there. There is good news in a world that is becoming increasingly bad news, because really the only hope of the world is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if you own the world. What does the profit of man if he gain the whole world and loses his soul? You know, what does it matter if a caliphate is uh, established with all these sultans, uh, you know, men of power dominating everywhere, and they all go to hell? Antichrist will rule the world for seven years and be the first occupant of hell along with the false prophet. What good did it do anybody, and especially him? But such is the power of marriage and the family on any society. Exalt it, and it will exalt you. Gainsay it, and ignore it, and despise it. And literally, it will destroy you as we're seeing in our nation. As we're seeing around the world. So what can America expect? We who have minimized, downplayed, attacked, legislated against marriage. You know, 35 out of the 50 states of America now uh, recognize some form of legal homosexual marriage. That's a tragedy. We've become a monstrous Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, uh, we've exalted uh, alternative lifestyles. We've aborted now several generations. We are now on an irreversible slide of decline as far as population. Can we come back from a 1.6 fertility rate? Nobody ever has. Can we? I don't know. I don't think so. You know, and we know, we know biblical prophecy and stuff, so we don't fear... Uh, we count our lives but lost for the sake of Christ. So really, uh, just bringing up this stuff, I want you to understand the power 
of marriage and family and how we have despised it, we've downplayed it, we've talked about it and done nothing about it. And still the decline keeps going. And it's sad to watch. Barring a major miracle and a national revival and turning to God in Christ, as we look at history, the days are numbered. Very numbered. Unless we start taking these things seriously. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I read a statistic. It's a little bit humorous, but it's not really funny. Uh, since 2009, adult diapers have outsold newborn diapers in America by as much as 28%. You understand what that's saying? You know, we have an aging population and there's nobody coming up. You know, Social Security, why do they think it's doomed? Well, you know, the pyramid is upside down. It's not right side up. You know, it should be new generations. You know, we've aborted, what, 57 million children who would now be having, producing children, forming families, and so on and so forth. And that's probably two generations that we've aborted. We are a culture of death, as many have said. But where life takes place is in marriage and the family, right? I mean, that's, that's where it takes place. And that's where it's sustained. That's where it's sustained. This is where the revival starts. You know, we're, we're talking about U4G, united for the gospel until they all hear. Well, what are they hearing as they look at our lives? Are they seeing the power of the gospel? Are they seeing the power of God in our marriages because of our love and our spirit-filled relationship with one another? Our teaching our children, instructing them in the, in the, the things of God and the Word of God? Are they seeing that? Or, or is the world looking on and going, wow, those Christians are amazing people because look at their lives, look at their marriages, look at their relationships. Look at their children. Look at how they relate and love one another. Look at how they love even the unlovely in the world. That's where revival starts, and that's where it's sustained. It starts in our homes. It starts with spirit-filled men and women forming spirit-filled relationships, leading to spirit-filled marriages and the establishing of families, demonstrating spirit-led, spirit-directed, spirit-filled lives to a watching world. You know, spiritual revival begins when God's people love God and they love Christ with all their heart, soul, minds, and strength. When they love Christ and they put Him at the center of the home rather than themselves. You know, the gospel's not about us. It's about the grace and mercy of a loving, caring God and Savior, isn't it? And we reap the benefits. You and I reap the benefits of knowing a great God and a great Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and uh, it begins as we praise and worship God as we're filled with thanksgiving and mutually submissive to one another. And, you know, that takes root in the home, doesn't it? That's where it takes root. Homes are so, so important. You know, you look at Islam, okay, There's a perversion going on there, and people say, oh, those poor Islamic women. You know, they're so suppressed. Well, in our society, women are becoming more like men, and we don't need more men. We need men to be men, and we need women to be women, right? We said that a few weeks ago, but that's the deal. We need women to be women. We need Men who love the Lord Jesus Christ, loving their wives as Christ loves the church. We need uh, wives submitting to their husbands' leadership as, as uh, they submit to the Lord. And, you know, those are the things we need. You know, in verse 22, as spirit-filled wives uh, submit to, to, the spirit-led, uh, to the spirit-led leadership of their husbands. Verse 25, as spirit-filled husbands love their wives as Christ loves the church as with a self-sacrificing love and nurturing when men love and nurture those they lead, not try to dominate them. Chapter 6, verse 1, as spirit-filled children obey and honor their parents in the Lord. It's sustained 
In chapter 6, verse 4, as Spirit-filled fathers take the lead in their home and they bring up their children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And then what takes place on a daily basis in the home finds its way into the body of Christ, the church, because we're the church collectively of the living God, right? But we're all made up of family units, right? Everybody had a mom and dad somewhere. (laughs) And, you know, we may be singles, we may be single parents, we may be married, we may be married with kids, we may be uh, old, the older grandparents, we're, uh, you know, maybe grandparents where the mate has passed away, and, and yet we are the family of God, right? But where that is sustained is in the smallest unit of society, and that's the family. That's how important what we're going to be saying in the next few weeks is. And godly marriages and godly families and godly people from the nu- form the nucleus of the church that speaks good news to a watching world as the world sees that the gospel of Jesus Christ raises the spiritually dead to spiritual life and it transforms the heart and soul of men and women and children. And the world sees the difference Christ makes in every strata of society. And it becomes a very winsome picture very powerful, powerful picture of Christ's relationship with the church. That's why right toward the end of that passage, he says, this mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. This really isn't about marriage. This is about Christ and the church. We're a little, uh, I guess you could say, a picture of the grand family picture. We're the little picture there. Each family makes up that, that grand picture, right? And when you and I live spirit-filled, spirit-led, spirit-directed lives in that picture, then it benefits the the entire scene, I guess you could say. And then, amazingly, as people see that, those whom God has called are irresistibly drawn to Christ as they observe the lives of men and women and children who make up marriages and families and they hear the good news of the transforming redeeming message of the savior through the transformed alive church you and me that's revival and it takes place through and is sustained through the most basic of human institutions marriage and the family it's interesting how it all fits together so i ask you uh Is it any wonder that as we see marriage and the family in decline, both here and in many parts of the world, we also see the church in decline? You know, it's interesting, uh, particularly in America and Europe, where we are not even seeing enough converts to replace those who are dying off. That's a tragedy. We need to get out there, not only live exemplary lives, but tell the people the reason why we're living exemplary lives. That it's because of the Lord Jesus Christ at the center of our life individually and our life corporately that makes the eternal difference. That's why I love my wife in spite of herself. That's why she loves me in spite of me. And uh, you wouldn't want to have been in our house this morning. <laughs> Didn't get a very good night's sleep and was just crabby and everything and You know, getting over the residue of this cold, and I managed to get my wife sick, so she's about four days recovering behind me. And, uh, you know, but you know what? We love each other. And we nurture each other. We, for the most part, all the time. But, uh, you know, we mess up. I'm sorry, dear. (laughs) But, uh, you know, I would hope people could walk into our lives individually and go, yeah, that's what a Christian should be. That's what a Christian should be doing. And then they could walk into our families and go, yeah, that's, that's how Christians should, uh, should conduct themselves and that's how they should be living. Or, if, or, you know, we all experience brokenness. We all experience problems. But you know what? God restores the broken, doesn't He? He restores the hurting. He heals the hurting. He, he works with those who have, made, who have sinned and made mistakes and 
gotten on the wrong track. And He restores them as they turn to Him. And as they turn to Him, people see the, re- the redeeming, restoring grace of God in their lives and they just sit there in awe because they're getting pounded by life. And here you see a Savior just sitting there with open arms, receiving them and loving on them and restoring them to where they need to be. You know, what a, what a powerful, powerful picture we paint through marriage, through family, through the family of God to, to a watching world. When that's not there and religion just becomes rote and, you know, you go through the rote thing and people just go, that's nothing. I got the same thing down at the Elks Lodge or the bar or whatever. You know, we need to be showing people through our lives individually, our life corporately as families, through our lives as the body of Christ, uh, the wonder of the gospel. And that becomes the, that becomes the basis, the, the, the base which you carry out the operation of spreading the gospel. Such is the power of marriage in the family. It can be the source of great eternal good and revival in any culture as God uses it for the glory of Christ, or it can be the demise of that culture. And Satan will fill the void all the while imitating God's best and using that power for his own destructive purposes as he is through the statistics I just read you. So the question is, as God, Christ's followers, as followers of God, what would we rather see? Godly men and women producing godly families and proclaiming and living out the gospel or Satan doing his best to imitate our Father's plan through a false, evil religion? I hope each of us realizes the importance of what we're about to study and uh, Sorry I didn't really get into the text, but we'll begin that next week. And, you know, I really want you to be in prayer as we go through this passage because so much depends on it. Both on an individual, a corporate, and even even a national and an international level. That Christians display the wonder of Christ's grace in and through their lives, in and through the way they live, in the way they conduct their families, in and the way they spread the gospel in and through their families and and acquaintances. Um, You know, we need to really make that effort to raise our children and our grandchildren to be godly men and women. Because they'll be the new generation coming up. And there's... I don't think there's ever been a time in the history of the world where the temptation has been so great and it's been foisted on our kids and it's just a you know it's interesting the name of that conference being daunting (laughs) it's a daunting world that we live in but the things we talked about this morning are the reality of it and the reality is becoming more so and yet You know, light never shines so bright as when it shines in the darkness, right? You know, on the full moon, my flashlight doesn't work very well. Take it out there when that baby's gone and and it lights up the whole terra firma. That's the way our lives should be. So, anyway, as the world, you know, you know prophecy well enough to know that the world is becoming climactic. But you know, that doesn't mean you give up. That doesn't mean you hide. That doesn't mean you become less bold. It just means you take your stand, stand firm against the schemes of the devil, and you proclaim Christ. You live Christ. You let Christ live his life in and through you. And that's the reality of our world. And you know what? We can still have an incredibly powerful impact on this world through the Lord Jesus Christ. We're able to do, as Ephesians 3.20 says, exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all we can ask or think according to the power that works within us. And he says, to him be the glory in the church 
and in Christ Jesus to what? To all generations. Whether we're living in the first generation or the last generation, it doesn't matter. We can have that powerful impact. And uh, I just want to challenge you this morning as we start our series on marriage and the family next week that this is God's divine design for marriage. And it works incredibly. We're going to go celebrate our 42nd anniversary. I hear Pastor Ray and Sharon just uh, celebrated their 50th yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> of course, he would never tell you. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I just wanted to announce that. But, you know, the peri- power of marriage in the family for you know, proclaiming, for healing, for fellowship is just phenomenal. And, uh, you know, when Satan gets in there and does his thing, it's also amazing the destruction that can happen. So, anyway, let's pray.